What are some good but inexpensive options to get you started in solar? Let's talk about attic antennas, and let's talk about wire gauge as it affects antennas, this time on Mailbag Monday. What's happening, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to Ham Radio Tube. My name is Mike, K8MRD. If you have amateur radio-related questions for me, shoot me an email, K8MRD at iCloud.com. I would love to hear from you. Let's talk solar. I've got a hurricane barreling down on Texas right now. See what I did there? And I most likely will lose power and have to use some solar and batteries. So this first question asks, my aunt and uncle replaced two 100 amp lithium iron phosphate batteries with one 300 amp battery in their camper. In an effort to dispose of the used batteries, they offered them to me. I said, heck yeah, I'll take them. I would too. I would appreciate advice on charge controllers, meters, battery boxes, and solar panels for these batteries. People who know me think I'm cheap. Yeah, you probably are then, <laughs> Dad. <laughs> I look for maximum value at the best price. You know from your retail experience the top dollar doesn't necessarily mean top value, and cheapest price usually equates to you get what you pay for. Somewhere in the middle is my playground. FYI, if this makes Mailbag Monday, I'll be interested, interested to see if any sad hams comment on me not having to pay for the batteries. <laughs> No, they only comment on me when I get things for free. They hate that. <laughs> so this is uh, this is right up my alley. I do have a hurricane coming. Uh, by the time this video publishes tomorrow, uh, I'll probably be right in the middle of it. So let's take a look at some things that I have used in the past uh, that work. So let's start with charge controllers. So if we hop over to my Amazon store, I've got all kinds of categories here and specifically like these three here, batteries, solar 12 volt stuff, battery box stuff, and you may want to think about inverters. But if we go over here to batteries, solar and 12 volt stuff, I've got a lot here. So for charge controllers, there's quite a few. Uh, I actually have this 40 amp uh, MPPT charge controller from Batteria. It's $119. That's pretty cheap. This is a fantastic charge controller. I used this when I lost power for a few days uh, and I hooked up like, I don't even know how many solar panels to it. Uh, works great. It's RF quiet. Another one that's just kind of quick and dirty. Where is this little guy? This one right here from Batteria Power. Uh, is a 10 amp charge controller. If you watched my field day video, this is the charge controller I was using to charge my uh, 100 amp hour battery with my power film panels. So you can hook roughly, figure about a, a, a five amp per 100 watt panel input you'll get. So you could plug 200 amp panels or, or 200 watts of solar into this and get roughly in, in perfect ideal conditions about 10 amps charging your battery. So this one at 36 bucks, you can find similar ones. These, these kinds of controllers range from usually 25 to, to $35, somewhere in that ballpark. This is MPPT, which is a little more efficient. Uh, and in my experience, this battery of power is RF quiet. The charge controller I use the most is this BioEno panel. This is a 12 volt, 24 volt, 20 amp power uh, or charge controller rather. So you can hook up to 400 watts of solar up to this, getting about 20 amps into your batteries. This is fantastic. If you head over to BioEno's website, uh, these are like 50 bucks. So very inexpensive, very effective. They're, they're pretty small. So I really like these guys. This is kind of my go-to. Uh, anything BioEno, use code HRT at checkout and you can save 10% off at BioENOPower.com. I don't get any commissions for it. It's just a deal I worked out with Kevin to help my viewers save money and obviously BioNO gets business for it. So use code HRT at checkout if you're shopping at BioNOPower.com. As far as meters, if we go to where I have battery box stuff, this Droke meter, I absolutely love. This is like my favorite meter in the world now. I just, I just bought one a few weeks ago, did a review on it. A little more expensive, it's 54 bucks, but it's really accurate. I like how it performs. I did a video on it, you can, you can check out. Um, but like the quick and dirty one are these guys here. And, and these are what I've been using in my battery boxes for years. They're $18. They'll accumulate your amp hours and your, you can see your current. They show you everything you wanna know about your battery. The downside is when you're charging, 
they're not going to decrease the amount of capacity that you've consumed. So this this top right here where it says 315 milliamp hours, whether you're pulling a load or putting power back into it, that's only going to go up. So you kind of have to do a little bit of math and figure out your state of charge uh, in terms of where the battery is at. But for $17, $18, these are very, very hard to, uh, to dismiss. Now, battery boxes themselves with a 100 amp hour battery are going to get tricky. Uh, I haven't really found one that's going to fit just a regular size battery without just being huge. When I built Jason from Ham Radio 2.0's box, we ended up with one of the Milwaukee, I think they're the pack out boxes. So you're gonna probably have to do some looking around by yourself. I don't, I don't have a good solution for a physical box unless they're those little mini batteries, which I would doubt they are. They, those fit in the, the Harbor Freight Apache, the 3800, I think they are, cases, uh, and they work great. So with a physical box, you're probably gonna find something that's uh, either just obscenely too big for what you want to, to make it portable, or too small, or it might just not be designed the way for you to put all of the accessories that you might want in it. So the physical box itself, in my experience, has been the biggest challenge. Now, as far as solar panels themselves, one of the very first solar panels I ever bought was from Rich Solar. It was, I don't know if it was this exact one. I actually gave it to my brother uh, a few months ago. But Rich Solar, these are rigid panels, so not ideal for just taking on a quick portable ham radio operation. But if you're setting this up at home, these Rich panels are fantastic. They're 80 bucks for a 100 watt panel. Get a couple of these guys, you're in good shape. Now, if you want something more portable, I like the Bioeno panels, if I can find them. This guy right here, this Bioeno 100 watt foldable panel. I use this all the freaking time. It just folds up into a little briefcase, comes with the connectors that you'd need. Done and done, uh, $209. Another panel that I use a lot is this one from Raddy, which is a subsidiary of Radioddity. This is their 120 watt foldable panel. Really, really a big fan of this panel as well. It's pretty much the same size as the Bioeno. Um, they say it's 120. You're going to get in really good sun, five, maybe a little over five amps out of it. This one's cool, though, because it comes with a whole bunch of these little uh, barrel coaxial adapters for plugging into different things. This also has a USB on it, which I don't think the Bioeno does. So like here, you can plug in some USB cables and power your devices off of that. So I'm a really big fan of this ratty panel as well. Now, another thing you want to look for is some good wire, depending on the load that you're pulling. Use pure copper wire. It's just exponentially better than copper clad aluminum, especially in longer runs where you're going to go from your solar panel to your charge controller. DC power has a lot of loss. And if you're not using really good copper stranded wire, or hard wire, whatever, whatever your preference is. I prefer stranded, it's more flexible, it's less prone to breaking. Uh, don't skimp out on the actual wire there, but hopefully that gives you some ideas on some quick and dirty ways to set up your solar. And thanks so much for writing in, I appreciate it. Next, we've got a question about attic antennas. This viewer writes, I really enjoy your videos and know you are the antenna guy. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I'd say I'm the antenna guy. I do like antennas, though. Just a quick note to see if you have any uh, videos on attic antennas. That I do not. So far, most of the discussions turn into attic antennas don't work. You need to just put an antenna in the trees outside. If that's true, I can live with that. I suspect you, know, you may know the answer to this. Uh, I was into radios in the 70s and recently got my general ham license. Congratulations. I know a little about radios and antennas from the setups I had on a tower back in the day. I took my tower down years ago. That is, that makes me sad. And I'm too old now to be messing around with it. I'm into RVing and bought some stuff to play with while doing that. I bought the Yaesu 991A, the X50A Diamond Antenna, I believe that's the VHF UHF antenna, and a Deluxe Buddy Pole Package Long Version, and a Rig Expert Stick 500. You, you got some good stuff there. My idea was to use those antennas in the attic when not RVing. 
I'm not having any luck at all. I haven't even gotten on the air yet, so I'm not sure what he means by that, but uh, I have a walk-up accessible attic that's easy to get to. If you have any info on attic antennas, please direct me to it. So when I first moved to Texas, to this house, I set up an attic antenna and I used a couple pieces of speaker wire and one of those uh, like BNC to, what do they call them, like a Cobra head adapter. I'll put one here. Um, and I just made a 20 meter dipole and it worked not very well. The thing about attic antennas is if you have any metal lining your roof, uh, all bets are off. Uh, you've created a Faraday cage and very little, if any, RF is going to get in or out of your house. So if you have like metal shingles or metal sheeting underneath your shingles, any of that stuff, attic antennas are not the way to go for you. If you just have some tar paper, paper and some, you know, regular shingles, you should have some success. Now, I've heard stories of guys using Wolf River coils, buddy poles, folded dipoles, folded end feds, folded fan dipoles. I mean, basically, where there's a ham, there's a way. So if your only option is to put an attic antenna in your, or, or an antenna in your attic, try it. See how it works. Throw that buddy pole up there. See if it works. Uh, I, I can't, I mean, there. I, I don't know if there's any antennas specifically made for attics. Uh, and here's where I'm going to rely on you, the viewer. If you guys have experience with this, drop a comment so this viewer might could learn from your experience. But in my very limited experience, I'm going to say go for it. You already have the stuff to make it happen. Try it out. Is it going to be as good as your antenna outside? Probably not. But is it going to work? Probably. So much like all answers in ham radio, I'm going to go with it depends. But thanks so much for writing it. I wish I had a better answer for you, but uh, just try it. You're going to have to try it and experiment and find out. And if you got to throw the antenna outside, hey, you got a, a hell of a portable antenna to do that. So one way or the other, you should be getting on the air. And lastly, we've got a twofer question here. This viewer is writing, I'm wondering if you would be so kind as to answer two questions for me. First, and I know I should probably know this, but when making an N-fed half wave or any wire antenna for that matter, does the gauge of the wire make any difference? Second, my house doesn't have a basement, so I have to run all my coax through the attic. Will the extreme temperatures degrade the coax? Thanks, Bob. Bob, thanks for writing it. So first off, to touch on the wire gauge. In antennas, everything affects everything. And I remember when I first got into ham radio uh, and started really learning about antennas, and probably more so once I upgraded to general, you start hearing and reading about how wire gauge can affect antennas with like larger diameter, larger gauge wires being more wide banded. That's kind of what, what I remember most outside of handling more power. The, the physically larger cable can handle more power. However, I use 26 gauge wire for like every single one of my portable antennas. Uh, the yellow soda beams wire is primarily what I use. I've had no problems getting great bandwidth with it on all the bands the antenna is made for. Uh, and I only have a 100 watt radio, so I don't worry about pushing more power to it. Home, I have two 10 antennas, 49 to one and fed half waves with, uh, I'm using the the poly stealth. Is that what it is? I think the poly stealth wire, 18 gauge poly stealth wire. Works fantastic. Again, bandwidth is great. I only have 100 watts here at home, so I don't worry about it. Uh, if e Even if uh, I ran a, a MFJ off-center fed dipole that I believe had 14 gauge stranded wire, uh, that was rated for higher power, uh, and that was a hell of an antenna. But in, in my experience, unless you're running serious power, I don't, I don't think you really need to worry too much about uh, the power. And again, bandwidth 
hasn't really changed. Another thing, the uh, a jacketed versus a bare copper wire will have different performance in terms of velocity factor. So the antenna may be physically longer or shorter depending on what, uh, uh, if, if it's a jacketed wire or uh, a bare wire. But in my experience, and I'm sure some engineers are gonna chime in in the comments, uh, and, and please do, uh, more of the science behind it, but at the end of the day, yes, it's measurable. Does it really matter in the real world? In my experience, no. And now to get to your second part of your question, my house doesn't have a basement, so I have to run all of my coax through the attic. Will the extreme temperatures degrade the coax? Short answer, no. But let's dive a little deeper into it. So let's hop over to Messi and Poloni's website, and we're gonna click here where it says compare coax. We're gonna go to their coax calculator tool. And let's click feet, and let's pick a cable. Let's just do Ultraflex 7, just for the heck of it. And let's make this 100 feet. And let's just say 14 megahertz at, oh, it's 93 degrees as I'm filming this. Hit enter. And we can see all kinds of specifications here. And look at this power handling right here. So at, a, at 93 degrees, with all these parameters, this will handle 2,724 watts. Well, let's say now, because I have this cable in the Sahara running above my house right now on the shingles in the hot Texas sun. So let's just say it's 150 degrees up there. So we did lose a little bit of performance in terms of power handling. That's kind of about it though. These cables are designed to be outside. They're designed to handle the elements and Messi and Poloni specifically made the Sahara version of the coax, which has a white jacket to help eliminate some of the losses due to heat. And he made these for guys in like the Middle East who were calling them because it's 100 million degrees in the desert there and wanted something that didn't have a black jacket. So that's why the Messi and Poloni Sahara has a white jacket to reflect some of that heat. But the heat in your basement, the heat on my roof uh, is not significant enough to degrade performance in any appreciable, we'll use a Josh word there, appreciable manner. Uh, you know, the jacket's not gonna melt, nothing bad is gonna happen, the center dielectric is gonna be just fine. Uh, so again, you just don't need to worry about it. Put the coax up there, get on the air, and make some contacts, and thanks for writing in. And guys, if you have amateur radio-related questions for me, shoot me an email. I want to hear from you. K8MRD at iCloud.com. My name is Mike, K8MRD. Thanks so much for watching another episode of Mailbag Monday 73.